Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today, I would like to talk about homosexuality, tradition, and law for a very specific reason. It is because, in the most recent Mentally Advanced series, I had somebody in the comments ask me, uh, why did Fluttershy's parents give her a hard time about being gay? They said, uh, surely, Celestia's religion, which they must all worship, uh, wouldn't encourage homophobia. And I've actually had this question not just about this, this is the first time I've kind of made a joke like that with Fluttershy. But in the past, I've also had Applejack get a little bit snippy with Big Mac about the, the implication that he kind of fools around with the boys sometimes. Uh, so today what I thought I would do is I would talk a little bit about where I am coming from with this joke. And there is a, a structural reason. And in fact, I've got a note card because it's, it's sort of a, a more of a historical narrative as far as the explanation goes. This is an exploration on uh, humanity's social history. And, uh, and, and yeah, there's, there's actually a lot of reasoning uh, why we have in the past, why humanity in the past has been really hard on homosexuality, and why today, in the modern era, we are actually coming away from that harshness and being more accepting of it. Uh, we've had a lot of changes, but if you look all the way back at, at history, the first written history, history we really have uh, is when humanity began to enter, enter kind of uh, tribal societies, or rather after they had already entered tribal societies. Uh, anything before that, which they might suspect, maybe people walked around as, you know, nomadic bands or whatever. Uh, they weren't really riding anything, they were just running around getting eaten alive by lions and tigers and bears, oh my! And, uh, and that was pretty much life for humanity, we were just a bunch of dumb monkeys. Um, you know, people could communicate, surely, but, uh, but they weren't riding. But anyway though, after they settled down and they formed tribes, we find that virtually anywhere you look across the world, uh, ancestor worship was one of the biggest things that, that people do. Uh, in fact, it's so important that, uh, that, that they coined this term, the tyranny of cousins, which essentially is that uh, uh, your family pretty much ran everything back in the day. In ancient tribes, your family pretty much ran everything. And this is still true in a lot of societies. I've known several people who came from India, or those regions thereabout, and they could probably confirm for you that uh, it is not uncommon for the family to still be tyrannical and in control of virtually everything that, that you do. Um, it's still not, I mean, in some parts of India, it's, it's still, you know, very common for your family to actually, like, pick a husband or wife for you. And not really to force you into the marriage, but just to say, like, oh, you know, this, look at this, look at this boy, like, wouldn't he be such a good boy? Or look at this girl, like, wouldn't she just be lovely? And they introduce you and they try to get you to get married because, uh, you know, it's a family friend thing or something like that. It's a bit of family politics. But ancestor worship, though, uh, it came in, in uh, you know, two different forms because those are kind of your options. You got patrilineal uh worship or you got matrilineal worship and that's you know uh, they care about who you you know did you descend from the father you know wh whose mother did you descend from whose father did you descend from and uh, and so they would either honor your mother or they honor your father and so if they honored your father then you were the you know son of some of Gimli son of Glorm uh, descended from from uh, Merlin the 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 sad Merlin the sad and so so you know who you where you came from that was important and the reason that was because is, is because uh, life up until very recently actually has been far more agricultural. And so in tribal level societies, everything was kind of segmented. You find that before they really established state level bureaucracies, uh, each, each group would kind of have their own little tract of land. And uh, based on who you were descended from, that would determine your rights and your inheritance and like, you know, you were supposed to be doing this job and you would do this thing. And then when you went and you got married, you know, you would, you'd have a wife and you'd bring her into your life. And, and commonly, uh, the most common system would be that your wife would marry into your society and she would give up her surname and she would become part of the, the man's family. And then uh, when she, you know, she would have a son and you would pass on the land to the son and, uh, and so on and so forth. This was the most common way of doing things. And of course, back in those days, you find that uh, people were very susceptible to disease. There was no such thing as penicillin or anything like that. So, uh, so it, was, it was actually common uh, both for common, you know, the peasantry, and also for, for leaders, for influential leaders, to find themselves in a situation where they were the next in line, you know, they were an important part of their lineage, but yet they couldn't have a son. You know, like maybe they would have a wife and she would give birth to a son, but then the wife would die after childbirth, and then, you know, the son would survive for a month or two, and then die of some kind of disease, because infants are very vulnerable. Uh, and so you see this, you, you actually see this frequently, where you have like, uh, emperors or whatever who would have like numerous kids you know like four or five kids and then like you know the fourth kid would be like a daughter and the daughter would survive but uh, but then all the sons you know like all the sons would just die from disease and so then the, the emperor would get too old 
you know, and his, his wife would pass away, and it just, you'd just run out of time. And, uh, and so the traditional way of passing things down would get, you know, messed up. And so you might then pass things along to the daughter. Some, some societies had a system for that. But, uh, but other societies, you know, it was like, well, okay, so your brother takes over, you know, like the, the brother of the emperor takes over and then his son. And you get a brand new dynasty going, um, you know, and this is kind of how the system worked. So lineages were very important. Ancestor worship was very important. The idea being that as long as you had ancestors to remember you, you never really died. And you still see this in, like, uh, for example, Mexican culture, you know, where the Day of the Dead, where you go back and you honor your, your dead ancestors. You remember the people that came before you. It's all part of your line. You honor their line. And as long as there's someone alive in your line to honor you, you live on, you know. But of course, people, people of course, the lines end, and whole family lines are forgotten, theoretically. So, uh, so yeah, so very important, ancestor worship. Uh, the earliest that we actually have on a centralized bureaucratic state that, that really tried to get away from the whole family unit being a method of controlling everything and determining everything about your life is the Qin Dynasty, the very first Chinese dynasty. Uh, Qin Shi Hong was a strong proponent of a system called legalism, where he believed that, uh, that everything should focus on the state. You know, the emperor held absolute power and that he would assign everybody their jobs based on uh, how good they were at their jobs, their merits for the jobs. And, uh, and so what he did actually is he tried to eradicate a lot of the old traditional family values. And the reason why he did this was because uh, due, due to the way that people kind of organized them into tribal and family societies, it got to where like certain families had controlled like, you know, large tracts of land. You know, you got, you got sort of this, this vassalage thing where you'd have a fiefdom, like one family became influential and powerful, and they had been for generations, and they'd pass that power down from father to son or whatever, and they controlled these lands for a long time. And so Quincy Hong didn't actually really want to rely on this whole, this whole family thing anymore. He wanted to install people in power that were loyal to his dynasty, and that were following what he wanted to do, and that he thought were, were worthy of having land. And so a lot of times he took like loyal generals or loyal soldiers or people who performed well and they tried to assign them land. The whole idea behind legalism was that it was supposed to be a very impartial and much more sensible form of governing that would work for a, for a large country, which is what China had become. Uh, like I say, this is the very first ever uh, sort of state-level bureaucracy that arose. Um, you know, it was, it was the one that, that it, and it failed. It fa actually failed very quickly. Uh, what wound up happening was that Qin Shi Hong established laws that were much too strict. Uh, he insisted that the death penalty should be carried out for a lot of things that probably shouldn't be carried out for. And one famous anecdote from the period says that the first rebellion actually occurred when a group of soldiers had been told that delay would be punished by death. If they, they had to go from, they had to march from one place to another and they were told that delay would be punished by death. So they went out and of course it rained and then the roads got muddy and, and it screwed up their progress and they were going to be really late and they said to themselves, well, you know, if we're going to be executed one way or the other, why don't we just like fight a war against the empire until they kill us all anyway? I mean, you know, at least we'll get a few more days out of that. So supposedly this is how the first rebellion ever occurred. And when the rebellions got severe enough that they finally overwhelmed the Quinn dynasty, they, uh, they did so with the help of a lot of the old entrenched families that used to own a lot of land. So what they wound up doing is they overthrew this legalistic system that focused more on uh, assigning land and, and, and titles and so on and so forth by merit, and they, they brought back the old family system. And they said, okay, so these families helped me win power, so these families are now in charge of their land again. I'm giving them their land back. And this was actually based... Uh, uh, you find that uh, Confucianism and legalism continue to sort of be at each other's throats in China for a very, very long stretch of time, uh, probably even still today. Most people are more familiar with Confucianism if you tell them, about, if you ask them, name a cultural thing that came out of China, name, name a cultural ideology that came out of China, they'll actually tell you Confucianism. And this is because Confucianism held on for much, much longer and was much more pervasive than, uh, than this sort of impartial legalistic perspective of, of government or, or people. Uh, Confucianism focused more on roles in the family. It focused a lot on, you know, this is what the father does, this is what the mother does, this is what the sons do, you know, this is what your brother is to you, uh, and this is how you all relate to the state. And generally Confucianism placed, you know, like your father at a level higher than the government. So if your father did something illegal, you know, the son was not supposed to tell the government that the father had done something wrong. The son was supposed to express loyalty to his father and, you know, if, if the neighbors thought that something was illegal, it was up to the neighbors to report this to the, you know, to the authorities. But the son, the son was not to report the father to, you know, to the government. So, 
so yeah, so it put family on a higher level than government, made it more important. And Confucianism endured uh, much better. It jived with people much better. It stuck with the old traditions well. And, uh, and, and like I say, you see, you see it stuck with them for a very, very long time. And in fact, a lot of the old religions, virtually every religion that came out, uh, all kind of focuses, it focuses a lot on family. I mean, if you look at Christianity, and they talk about Jesus, they care a lot about what line he came from. Like, he came from the line of David. And that's very significant. You see that, you know, uh, Judaism, uh, uh, Islam, they care a lot about family lines. They talk about the family lines. They say, this is where this man came from. This is who he was. Uh, you know, this was his lineage. Lineage was important. And they talk a lot about uh, what does the father do? What does the wife do? What are their responsibilities? And again, this was because uh, so much of the world, so much of humanity was wrapped up in, in assigning roles and jobs according to which families you were born into. Uh, you know, there was mostly agriculture. Like, every, most, most people were farmers. A lot of occupation was wrapped up in farming. So, uh, if you go over and you look, you know, further to the west, you look at the Greeks, you find that a lot of times when people talk about, uh, well, you know, homosexuality used to be really popular, it used to be really good. Some people get under, under this impression. Because if you look at the Greeks, you know, like you could say, like, well, the Greeks invented butt sex. I mean, the Greeks were practically, you know, they're famous for it. Like, and, and Sapphica invented uh, lesbian sex. Like, you know, uh, the, the island of Lesbos, I mean, that's why, we, that's why we even call them lesbians, is because on the island of Lesbos, like, everyone was lesbian. Um, but these were philosophers. These were philosophers and Alexander the Great, I think. Uh, Alexander the Great was, was probably, he might have been gay. There's, there's some good chances that he might have been. But Alexander the Great was, he was very fond of the idea of soldiers making love to each other to cement their bonds on the battlefield. And you find that there were a number of philosophers who also felt that this was a good idea. Uh, there's, there's an anecdote about a group of, I think about, uh, I can't remember how large this group was, but there was an anecdote about a group of soldiers who were all supposedly lovers and, uh, and according to the anecdotes, they fought harder than just about any other unit out on the field because they didn't want to run off and leave their, lo their lovers behind to die. So you have all this, all this talk in, uh, in ancient Greece about, you know, homosexuality and, and what a great deal it is. But if you actually look at it, the people who are really pushing this were themselves uh, probably gay or lesbians. And, uh, and they were oftentimes philosophers or the type of people who really didn't do a lot of manual labor and didn't really care all that much about uh, land ownership or things like that. Like for example, Aristotle didn't really become a philosopher because his father was a philosopher. It wasn't like a title that was passed down from father to son. You know, Aristotle wasn't Aristotle, son of uh, Steve, the great thinker, or anything like that. Aristotle was just kind of like Aristotle. He had a father. His lineage was probably important. Uh, but if you actually look at the laws and the way that they were organized, you find that, that even the Greeks, in spite of uh, having writing that sort of said a lot of good things about homosexuality, it was still illegal to intentionally end your family line. If it could be proved that you were attempting to not continue your family, like if you were refusing to marry, you were refusing to have kids, uh, that was illegal because essentially you were killing your family line. Like all of your ancestors, everything that lived up to that, all of humanity's work up to this point, as far as your family was concerned, was being destroyed by you. So it was illegal. You had to get married. You were supposed to have kids. It was expected. It was how you passed things along. So even in those days, you find that the homosexuality thing, although, although glorified more in those periods, it was actually the exception and not really the rule. Uh, I mean, there's there's always been gay people, and there's always been you know it's, there's always been gay and lesbians, and it's it's never not been a thing. I mean, like the church used to have like rules because they would get really up because they were they were like oh they were like oh you know our our priests or whatever have to be celibate, and then the priests would get lonely and they would start banging each other, and then they came in and they were like no, and I'm like I remember reading a thing where they like laid out a bunch of really specific rules where they were like do not have the gay sex. And then, like, the priest would get kind of uppity, and they'd be like, well, what qualifies as gay? You know, because we're just sort of like, 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 if, I, if it gives me a handy, is that going to be, is that gay? Is that too gay? And so they had to actually, like, lay out all the rules. They, like, explicitly, like, they, they do not rub between the thighs. Do not do this. Do not do that. That is against the rules, and this is against the rules. And so it created that sort of atmosphere uh, that you get where it's, where you get some, um, some religious groups that are just like, yeah, basically any, any sex except for a missionary position with the lights off. That's pretty much, that's, God does not like that. So, uh, so religion though, religion isn't really the cause of, uh, of the anti-homosexual thing. This is, it's, it's rooted so far back in history 
Um, but it's not a wonder that religion enforces it, because what religion did is it really codified a lot of traditional laws, and it told you a lot about what to do with family. And so you find that because Christianity focuses a lot on family and how family works, and, and you know, father's responsibilities to the son, son's responsibilities to the father, so on and so forth, that they, they condemn homosexuality because uh, many societies across the world just condemned it. Because if you had, I mean, like it comes back to that idea where if you're kind of in a, in a difficult spot, like suppose that you are that emperor and, uh, and you know, you're having, you, you're having an impossible time having kids. Like, you know, all of your kids keep dying and then you finally have a son and then it turns out your son is not interested in women. Like, well, well, that's just going to end your family line. You know, it's, it's sort of like, well, you have to get married and you have to have kids. You, you, you can't just, you can't just like date a guy. You have to go do something else. So, uh, so that was, that was just how it was. Uh, it's not until really the advent of modern medicine and modern agriculture that we've come away from that way of thinking. Uh, also, transit systems have been very important. If you look at the way that we live in the States today, uh, most of the time, so like I'm the son of, of, of a family, uh, but what I do is I just kind of, I, what anyone really does anymore is you just go where the work is. So if you become an engineer, uh, then you go and you, you go to where the engineering jobs are. Like if you're a petroleum engineer, then you go and you work at the oil wells in Iowa or something like that. You just pack up and you move. And it's easy to do because planes take us very far, very fast. And, uh, and we don't really do agriculture quite so much anymore as we used to. We, we rely a lot more on machinery and a far fewer number of people can manage large groups, like, like large farmlands. Uh, so it's not nearly as important. In fact, you find that we also shortened, we shortened the uh, summer break for kids. Because it used to be that you would rely on your kids during the summer to help take care of the fields. Uh, so nowadays we don't we don't really rely on that. We've shortened the summer break, and you know, woe woe to children. Uh, but, but yeah, the whole farming thing it's not nearly as important as it used to be. The land ownership thing is not nearly as important as it used to be. Uh, inheritance rights are not nearly as important as it used to be here in the states. So uh, so modern medicine too, and also you know infant mortality rates. You expect your kids to survive these days. Like if you settle if you settle down with a lady and you have kids, you expect their kids to survive. So, you know, if mom and dad uh, have like two kids, uh, you know, roll, just rolling the dice, the odds are good that one of them is is going to continue on your lineage. Uh, even, you know, if you really care about that at all, it's kind of up to you these days. So, uh, now, as far as uh, family rights in general, we don't actually care uh, quite nearly as much about whether or not you're carrying on the family line. Families are still important, of course, however. You see that if you look at politics, uh, we have who's running for president. We have Jeb Bush from the Bush family. You know, the Bush is a very influential political family. We have Hillary Clinton from the Clinton family. The Clintons are an important, influential family. Giving them money are the, uh, the Koch families. The Koch family is highly influential, very rich. We've got the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers have been around for a while. Influential, rich. The Waltons. The Waltons are doing stuff. Influential, rich family. Families are still super important to modern politics. But this is more to the, uh, to the landed elite, to the common peasant, to the common nobody just living around the states. Uh, you know, it's actually probably more common for your parents instead of giving you the house. Because, like, again, if you, if you pack up and you move to Iowa because you're a petroleum engineer, it doesn't do you a lot of good if your parents are living in Florida and then they give you the house in Florida. Like, what are you going to do with the house in Florida? You're going to sell it, right? And then you're going to buy a, a house in Iowa. So it's much more common now for... Uh, for parents to retire or uh, you know like we've got pension plans and retirement plans and things like that and so parents will just retire you know they sell the house they move into a little area they, they keep the house they retire on the house you know whatever the case is inheritance does not matter nearly as much for the common person uh, so yeah so all these things kind of play together and this this actually brings us to the supreme court case that we had uh just uh, last year unless i'm losing track of time because uh, because because i'm losing track of time but anyway the uh the supreme court case that we had just recently regarding gay marriage um if you think that all of this is too analytical and for whatever reason because it's too analytical it's deeply unfair to the homosexual community it's really not because you find that actually what won that supreme court case was exactly this analytical approach and uh and essentially what they did is they got up there, and people make a lot of moral arguments when they talk about homosexuality, like, is it moral, is it right, is it wrong? And they talk about, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, it's, oh, it's better, it's worse, it's this or that, you know, the sanctity of this and the sanctity of that. But when you come right down to it, when you look at it as a sort of legal institution, a political institution, um, marriage has changed a lot because society has changed a lot. And so we find that uh, today, 
marriage does not mean hardly anything compared to what it used to. Marriage used to be like the core uh, of, of family life. I mean like who you got married to, uh, you know, and what family you came from used to be like one of the single most important things that was ever going to happen to you. Like it, it, was, it was a major deal. But these days, you know, you're just going to go. People are more nomadic. You're just going to go wherever you're going to go. You're going to marry whoever you're going to marry. Uh, if you have kids, you have kids. If you don't have kids, you don't have kids. You know, and, and you're not going to get in a situation where, you know, failing to have kids is going to screw up a ton of a ton of legal stuff. Because we've also got a bureaucratic legal system, a centralized bureaucratic legal system that will assign rights uh, according to paperwork and whatnot. Because we can all read now. It's much more common for everybody to read. In fact, the literacy rating. Uh, if you don't know how to read, by the time you're an adult in the Western world, it's seen as a it's seen as a travesty. And again, you know, maybe four generations ago, this was not nearly as common. You still had a lot of people who could not read, uh, and so the legal paperwork, you know, was really just not even on the table for them. So our system is much more bureaucratic. Life has changed. Things are different. And what the Supreme Court case argued is because things are so different, and the institution of marriage has changed so much, that there's really not an argument anymore against gay marriage. I mean, like, uh, basically now you get married for benefits, or for uh, tax reasons, or for this or that. There, there are a number of practical benefits, but these benefits don't really have as much to do with lineages or inheritance rights as they used to. So uh, two men can get married, and it's, it's, in essence, it's the same thing as if a man and a woman get married. There's no sanctity lost, there's no nothing as far as the practical concerns uh, are being infringed upon. There's there's no legal reason to be against it. There's no practical reason to be against it. Uh, there's there's uh, traditional reasons, and this is where it comes from. Is this is this is like you get people who still kind of are following the, tra the traditional institutions. You find the Bible has codified exactly what it is that marriage is supposed to be and what it's supposed to accomplish. And the main disagreement that you find is that the, the traditional perspective on marriage uh, is approaching marriage from a perspective that is no longer true. Like, marriage is not what it was, like, when, when marriage worked, when the Bible was written, marriage worked just differently. So, to tie this all back into the Mentally Advanced series, and how exactly, like, when people ask, like, why would Celestia uh, teach that homosexuality is wrong? Uh, probably she wouldn't. I would imagine she wouldn't care. But I think that still you would probably get a lot of, uh, like, as a parody of the show, like you look at My Little Pony and it's a very, it's very romanticized, you know, they live in this little village, you know, the apples own this farm. It's not like a corporate owned farm, right? It's the apple farm. And in fact, when the, uh, when the Finplan brothers came along and they were going to take the farm away, that was a huge deal because that was the family farm. It had been the family farm for generations, you know, the apples, the, the apples own farms. Like they, they build farms out in the desert or whatever. Like when Apple Bloom gets older, who knows? Maybe she's gonna marry, she's gonna get married off to a cousin, and that cousin's gonna set up a farm in the tundra with her, with some other crazy place. Because that's what the apple, that's what the apple ponies do. That's the apple family thing, and the uh, and the pie family too. The pie family, they go out there and they harvest rocks, and so you know they like someone, someone in that family, either as a collective unit, as a collective family, or uh, or something else, owns those farms. Like, they have some kind of right or deed to those farms, and it's a traditional right. And so that means that if you take that, if you look at the romanticism in the show, uh, and this is the problem with romanticism, in any setting, in any setting, uh, what they like to do is they like to cherry pick. They, they look back at, you know, the old ways of life, the traditional ways of life, you'd be like, oh, you know, remember when a big family used to own the farm, and they would all work together, and they would run the farm, and everybody was a more cohesive unit. You know, that all sounds really great, until you think about the tyranny of the cousins thing. Uh, the idea that when that was the case, like you really didn't get to choose who you married because you had obligations to the family. You're, you know, somebody was going to inherit the farm. And in fact, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, Apple family farm, the way they've written, they've, the way they've written the show, looks incredibly grim. The parents are dead. Granny's on her way out the door. Uh, Big Mac and Applejack are the only ones old enough to do any work. And Apple Bloom has just gotten a cutie mark in acquiring cutie marks, which has nothing to do with farming. So she's going to be a subpar farmer, theoretically. So uh, who exactly owns the farm, and what are they going to do? Like, if you imagine, like, uh, and this is where, where I get the joke from. This is where I get the idea for the joke. Is a lot of people like to depict Big Mac as, as gay, because he's one of the only male characters in the show. So they're like, Big Mac is gay. Yes, he's, he's gay. He, he uh, is kissing on all the boy ponies. All the boy ponies. 
So if you look at this, this very traditional sort of approach to society, then you imagine that means that Applejack, everything falls on Applejack exclusively. And for this to work, like you have to assume that inheritance rights aren't based on gender. Like it would have to be something else. Like I like to imagine that uh, the kid that's gonna get the farm is gonna be the first kid to actually have a baby. Like whoever gets married and has a kid, they get the farm. And if you, if you assume that Big Mac is gay, and that Apple Bloom is, you know, a realm of uncertainty. They don't know what exactly Apple Bloom's gonna do because she's too young. That means that all the weight and all the pressure is falling down on Applejack. And I, and I mean, like, uh, like you remember that there was the episode where they explained that Applejack went away to go live with the Orange family for a little while too. And there's there's undertones there again if you look at the traditional thing, the idea of like, uh, I mean, like it was just Granny and Mac at that point, right? And then like Apple Bloom was too little. Um, I mean, the parent, like, the parents had died, so what were they doing then? I mean, they must have been, like, cousins that were out trying to take care of the place. Like, that farm has got to be on its last legs, and they never touch on that, but it must be. And Applejack's whole thing, too, her whole weakness used to be that she would overwork herself. She would work herself too hard. So if you want to kind of analyze that character and think about, like, why, why is it that she's got a penchant for working too hard, for overworking herself? It's because she's, she's trapped on the farm, uh, her family is dead, and, uh, and really, she's, she's one of the only two ponies who's capable of doing any work, so she pulls just an inordinate amount of weight. And, uh, and her brother just generally tries to stay out of the way and get as much work done as he can as well. And, uh, and because he's, he's maybe he's not good with words, he tries not to smooth things over, he just handles things, and that generally is the path of least resistance, you know. So it's actually kind of a grim, it's sort of a, it's sort of grim if you, if you think of things in a more traditional kind of way, a more rural, traditional uh, sort of setting. And again, you look back at the, uh, at the Pegasus ponies too, and even they, uh, they might have less concern about inheritance, uh, but they're still kind of shown as a more Spartan, kind of militaristic sort of society. And uh, and I assume that, that, you know, they still cared a lot about lineages, you know, like uh, like you're descendant from Lord Lord Hurricane, General Hurricane. And people are still like that, actually. I, I think like my own mom, uh, she, she used to be really into genealogy for a little while. And I remember her being like really excited because she found like we were related to some kind of general. Uh, you know, and it was like, she's like, oh, oh, we have a military, look, we have a high-ranking military officer in the family. And this was like so far back, it was like, yes, but what has our family done lately? Uh, but she was really excited about this high-ranking military general. Oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. So I imagine that the Pegasi are the same way. They care about their lineages and whatnot. And, uh, and I don't know, it's really not a big question. This is kind of a throwaway thing, the uh, uh, Fluttershy thing. The bottom line is, I just like to heap misery on the Fluttershy. So, uh... That's, that's where that really comes from. And the bottom line, as far as all this is concerned with homosexuality and how it has kind of uh, progressed through society, uh, is that it's not necessarily a religious thing, and it never really was. It's been codified by religion. It's, been help, it, it's helped uh, become tradition, thanks to religion. Um, but I mean, like, religion, religion has been very helpful throughout a lot of human society. If you look at, like, monasteries used to keep libraries. They're responsible for maintaining a lot of recorded history. They, they did a lot of education. Uh, I mean, like, if you just look at very practical, whether you're spiritual or not, whether you're spiritual or not, uh, religion did a lot of really positive things for people. And, and it's, it's certainly not, I don't know, it, it, like, people get a little bit weird nowadays. They're like, oh, well, you know, the traditions are defunct, and, you know, religion was always bad. Look at the Dark Ages. We would have been so much better with the Dark Ages. And it's kind of, you know, like, no, I mean, like, religion was actually pretty beneficial in a lot of ways. I mean... You know, Confucianism, like, like you get these different ideologies, and a lot of them are formed for a reason. And people adopt them, not because they're afraid of being killed at first, but they adopt them because they actually jive with how people are already behaving. You know, like, like if they tell you these laws, then people adopt them because they already kind of work with the way that humans are functioning. Like the Christian laws about family are very similar to the, you know, there's, there's, there's differences, but there's a lot of overlap between what each of the different religions tells people to do as far as family and inheritance and marriage and everything else goes. So, um, so yes, so that's how it ties into Pony, is that, uh, is that they're, a very, they're a very romanticized society, they're very kind of traditional, because that's more rural, that's more appealing, uh, but the thing about romanticism is that, uh, you know, you forget, about, you forget about the reality, the grim realities and the hardships of those times. Um, I assume that magic makes it possible for, uh, magic creates a low uh, uh, infant mortality rate, I guess? Um, 
I don't know. The ponies, the ponies are also interesting because they're matriarchal in appearance. I mean, like the princess kind of has ruled for a thousand years, and then like her sister Luna is the is the next highest leader, and then in Ponyville, like the the town is run by a, a female. Um, and matriarchal societies are actually totally unprecedented. Uh, from what I have read, we like there's not there has, has not really been a matriarchal society. Uh, women sometimes have been in charge. Like you have women that are you know you know the Zarina, the queen. Uh, the Empress Dowager, whatever, but there really hasn't been a system where the reins are specifically passed down from mother to daughter. It, it, generally speaking, it's usually passed down father to son, and that's that's how they operate those lines. So a matriarchal society is totally unprecedented. Um, I imagine it would work about the same as a patriarchal society, but uh, but it's just kind of interesting because, like I say, there's there's not really a human parallel for that sort of thing, uh, and not a direct human parallel anyway. But uh, but yes. The, the pony thing, like I say, like the, if you look at the Apple, Apple family, like you can tell that they're really not thinking about the sort of traditional uh, institutions when they put, set up the Apple family. Because it is incredibly sad if you think about it, if you really think about like how, those, how, those family, how the family would be organized and in what dire straits Applejack must be in. Uh, Applejack and her brother, even if you assume that like Canon, uh, Big Mac is, is not gay. And actually, Big Mac has never seemed attracted to it. I mean, he's, he's shown attraction towards more uh, female characters than he has to... He's never shown attraction to a, fem uh, to a male character. But, um, but assuming that Big Mac is still interested in, in mares and that he's going to get married, um, the fact that it's just him and his, him and his sister out there, uh, still, still very rough, very grim, very sad. Very sad for the apples. Uh, and so I assume, I assume that they really don't think about that when they do the writing. The idea is that they're, they're trying to cherry pick and they're trying to make the, uh, they're trying to play up the family angle and they sort of neglect the tradition angles as much as they can, the tradition and inheritance and responsibilities. Responsibilities generally fly out the window with romantic tales. So, yes. So anyway, that's where it comes from. It's not a homophobia thing. It's, it's more just kind of a grounding in like uh, traditional systems and the fact that the ponies are you know, set up in a more traditional way because because that's the theme of the show. Uh, you know. But anyway, though, uh, hope you guys are having a good day. I will catch you all next time.